you're walking through a desert, the sun's beating down on you, and you look down and there's a turtle, a tortoise coming toward you. You pick up the tortoise, you flip it over, you put it on its back. The tortoise's belly is baking in the hot sun, its arms are moving around, twitching, it's trying to right itself, but it can't do it without your help. And you're not helping it. How come you're not helping it? So this is a question from the movie Blade Runner. Uh, Blade Runner is a story of, um, well, it's a story of Richard Decker. He's out to uh, find some replicants who are, uh, they're, they're essentially genetically modified humans. And they, they're used as slave labor out on the outer planets. Uh, these folks, the replicants are just like human beings that are biologically the same. The only difference is they only live for four years and they don't really have any emotions. Uh, some of these replicants have decided to rebel. They uh, steal a ship. They're coming back to Earth and they're trying to find their maker, the company that made them so that they can get more life. Decker's job is to go and find them, hunt them down, and retire them. Uh, he does this uh, uh, and uh, ends up, you know, uh, getting rid of three of the four. He finally gets to the fourth one. And he's the leader of the replicant group. Uh, during the time uh, that these replicants have been alive, they've slowly started to mutate and have emotions. So they're developing these emotional feelings. They're becoming essentially humans. Uh, Decker plays sort of a cat and mouse game with uh, this final uh, leader of the replicant group. Uh, they run through abandoned buildings, they're running across rooftops, and at some point he's hanging off the edge of the building uh, after being pursued by the replicant. Sort of the, ta the tables have turned. The, where he was chasing them, now the lead replicant is chasing him. And as he's about to fall off of this building, the replicant grabs him and pulls him up, just drops him on the top of the roof and begins to tell him about what it's like for him to be alive. He's sort of uh, telling him all these experiences that he's had and how, you know, what it's meant to him. And it's sort of at this point that, you know, that, that Decker realizes that, yeah, you know, you know, the moral quandary of what he's been doing or what he's been asked to do. And, uh, you know, this story, I've always loved this movie, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's just sort of a multifaceted movie. But what it's really about, one of the main themes that it's about is about empathy and understanding what it's like to be someone else, what it's like to experience something someone else is experiencing. In the book, uh, it's based on a Philip K. Uh, Dick uh, story uh, called uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And uh, that book was written probably in the late 60s, so it was sort of very much about, you know, the... Uh, you know, I think it has a lot of ties to like the civil rights movement, things like that. So, you know, empathizing with people who are, you know, who are not like you and, and trying to find some common ground. Um, you know, when we think about empathy and we think about what it is to empathize with somebody, it's really about, you know, just what it's like to, you know, figuratively what it's like to walk in their shoes, to understand what their context of their life is about, what their feelings are, and sort of internalizing that and and trying to get a sense of who they are and what they're about. Uh, you know, newborns, uh, you know, if, if you see newborns in a nursery or even, you know, if you have, like, go to daycare or something like that, if one baby starts crying, they all start crying. Part of that's because it's really annoying when babies cry and they irritate each other. But part of it is because they're sensing, you know, some unrest around them. That's sort of very, the initial formation of empathy. Um, by the time we get to be about two years old, we start to understand, uh, you know, the emotions and, and sort of the motivations of people. You know, if, uh, if children, you know, if the sibling gets hurt, you know, brother or sister gets hurt, uh, you know, they'll come over and pat each other or just, you know, try to comfort each other. By the time they're four and they're toddlers, you know, they really start to understand what, it's, what the other person is feeling and they can start to understand not only the emotions but the motivations of the people around them. This is sort of the pro, they call it pro-social behavior. Um, and it's, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's inherent in us, this ability to want to understand the people uh, that are around us. And uh, it's interesting um, because if you win $100 in a lottery, say, 
your brain starts shooting off all sorts of dopamine. You feel really great about it. You feel terrific. You know, you won money. It's a good thing. If you give someone $100, you know, someone who's in need or a friend or whatever, a gift, your brain does the same thing. It sends off the same signals. It, it sends out dopamine at the same levels as it would if you had won. So again, it's sort of very encouraging to know that we are, uh, you know, we're, we're social folks and we're, we're, we're social uh, creatures and we, we need to be there for each other and we, we we're, all, we're sort of programmed to help each other in, in many ways. Um, you know, as we evolve our, uh, our, our sense of empathy, you know, one of the highest levels we can get to is this idea of altruism. And uh, you know, think of uh, this particular instance. In 1791, uh, George Fox, he was a, he was a Quaker uh, activist uh, in London. He uh, uh, saw a lot of issues, obviously, with the slave trade, the West Indian slave trade. Uh, a lot of the products that came out of the West Indian slave trade were sugar and rum. So he said, okay, enough. He printed up about 70,000 of these uh, little pamphlets, and he started distributing them around uh, London. He got about half a million people, half a million Londoners to, to, uh, you know, to lobby for the, for, for, well, actually, they boycotted sugar and rum, which, you know, if you think about it, that was a pretty significant thing to do. It was a, you know, for them, it was, you know, these are sort of the luxuries of their lives. And they were willing to give this stuff up uh, to help people that they have never met and probably never would meet. But they did it because it was the right thing to do, and they were projecting what it was like for those folks who had to actually work and, and, and create this stuff. So again, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a big part of who we are, and it's a, it's a huge force. When we don't have empathy, um, you know, the other end of the spectrum is, you know, is this. It's, in fact, uh, a, psycho, a psychopath is essentially someone who doesn't have empathy, one of the uh, dominating traits. Um, it's, uh, it, it's kind of funny, too. It's not that they don't have empathy. It's that they can turn it on and off. Sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't, which is even like creepier than <laughs> just not having it. Um, and there's a lot of work that's been done in the field. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Hare, he's from the University of British Columbia. He's written sort of this the definitive work on what it is to be a psychopath and, and you know, what those characteristics are like. So, you know, as I... I've written books, I've written, you know, I've worked a lot in the industry, and uh, I've worked with a lot of designers, a lot of web people, I work with a lot of writers, you know, and in, my, in the back of my mind, after I seen this list, I just couldn't help get it out of my mind, and I kept thinking about, you know, these characteristics, I know some of these people, you know, like, I've worked with these guys, all right, and it's, it's just kind of, you know, it's, it's very odd, um, but it's a... Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's something to think about. And I think about, you know, when we're working with clients, when we're working with our audiences, you know, do we ever sort of, you know, have these characteristics in the way that we're working with them? So again, why should we care about any of this stuff? Well, because, you know, when we get to, when we're talking about empathy, it's, it's really a key component of, of design. And it's a key, key component of the creative process, a key component of, of designers' work. Um, we can't design stuff for people without understanding who they are. You know, Joe, who was just up here, Joe Duffy, was talking a lot about all the work that they had done to sort of understand not only the client's needs, but also what it was to, like, experience the product and, and where it would be used and things like that. I mean, taking those deep dives is, is really critical. But again, it's, it's sort of the first step in, uh, in, in the design process. You know, and, and as we think about our roles as designers, you know, so much has changed in the last uh, 10 or so years. Uh, I know when I started my career, you know, 25 years ago, one of my first jobs was I cut ruby lift for Marvel, Marvel and DC Comics. So I'd get these ink boards that the uh, illustrators would put together. Does anybody know what ruby lift is in this room? Okay, we got, yeah, okay, that's a few people. There were like layers of ruby lift, and I'd have to go with an exacto and cut out, you know, Batman's cape or something like that, you know, and it was this really tedious thing. 
That was a tedious job, but it was a very straightforward job. I cut Ruby with, and you know, I did other sort of graphic design type things. That doesn't happen anymore. Right now, there's so many channels that we're working in, whether it's print and all the components of print. You know, now we're getting into digital, digital publishing. You know, we're converting our print pieces over into these digital formats. We've got the web and all the components of the web. Uh, we have social media. You know, it's complex. Things that we do now are, are very, you know, they're, they're, they're just multifaceted. They're not, not as straightforward as they used to be. And because of that, we end up having to collaborate with a lot of people, and mainly not only with our internal teams, but, but with uh, users and uh, audience as well. So, you know, it's again, th that sort of, the complexity requires that we bring in the SEO consultant, the web developer, the, um, you know, the writer, the editor, the designer, and be able to work with them in a, in a way that we're, 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 we're gaining information from them, we're using them, and we're, we're benefiting from what they know and their knowledge, and we're taking it and we're facilitating that conversation. And again, this is sort of the thing that I see changing in the design spectrum or for designers is, you know, we're, it's less about the hands-on work anymore. You know, you're all, all very talented in that area. That's, that's good, that's sort of the point, of, that's the, price of entry to get into the design world. The next thing is, how good of a facilitator are you? How good are you working with other people? How good can you bring people in to help solve the problem? Because again, you know, design isn't about, it's not an artistic or creative indulgence. We're here to solve a problem, a design problem, a business problem, an experience problem. We need to bring people in. We need to be able to talk to them. We need to you know, benefit from their, uh, uh, their experiences, you know, and again, when we think about who we're designing for, um, we need to understand context. We need to know, you know, how do they use the brand, product, service in their life? Uh, you know, what are their needs? What are their pain points? What are their, you know, where are they looking to get gains out of, the, out of you know, whatever it is we're providing? They are a rich source of, of information, of design information. And again, we're design problem solvers we need to understand what the problem is and uh, bringing in audiences and understanding their context of, of what their experience is really critical for that. The last one is, is accountability. And uh, again, this sort of speaks to, you know, uh, making sure that we're, we're testing, we're, we're being, you know, we're making sure our designs are, are well thought out. You know, there are a lot of ways that we can test design, certainly on the web, there are lots of ways to test design in print, testing it with the people that we're designing for to making sure that we're heading in the right direction. And a lot of this activity requires not just sort of process changes, but it's also about an attitude, coming into these projects with a different kind of attitude. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it sounds very, you know, Pollyannish, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta start to build trust with people. You gotta have a sense of that there's an honest and direct uh, type of communication that you're having and that you're giving people dignity, and I'll talk a little bit about this a little later. But, you know, involving people in the process is respectful, and it, and it brings, uh, gives people a voice, and it also gives them buy-in to whatever it is that you're doing. And again, as designers and design leaders, that's what we need to be able to do. We're, we can facilitate the conversation. You know, I've had several folks today talk about it. It's, you know, we have, we have a very unique and interesting and effective process that designers go through. And a lot of people don't, you know, the people that we're working with, they don't have that same process or they have, you know, we, we are the masters of the process. We need to be able to bring them in and be the leads on these things. So again, sort of bringing them in, facilitating, and, uh, and, and, and charting the direction for them. So again, thinking about empathy and design thinking and logic and business needs Again, empathy is sort of the center point of you know, the emotional aspect of, of what the client needs and what, what, the, what the goal is that we're trying to fulfill and the business logic. So there's sort of these two halves, these sort of right and left hemisphere kind of things. You know. And in the middle, you know, we've heard a lot about design thinking today and, and yesterday. That's really where this sort of uh, design thinking kind of lives. It lives between and I would say empathy for clients and audiences, but also empathy for understanding the business. We need to make sure that we understand what the goals of the business of our clients are and, and make sure that we're, we're, we're bringing them into the equation and, and, taking, and doing due diligence on our part 
to, uh, to understand it. Um, and Joe talked a little bit about that as well, that it was, you know, that they spent a lot of time asking, uh, you know, their clients questions about where they were going, you know, what their goals were, what they liked, what they didn't like, what the competition was like. Those are all critical questions that, that we need to ask. And, and again, that's sort of being empathic with the client. It's sort of in a business context, but it's still an attempt to understand someone or put yourself in their, their shoes. I would say that empathy as well is, is really at the, at the center point of a lot of what we're trying to um, um, create through design, and that's value creation, number one. As designers, we're problem solving. Part of that is by adding value, uh, creating value for our, for our clients and users. You know, innovation is another one. If we can harness you know, uh, the understanding of what the client need is, or, the, or I'm sorry, what the audience need is, we can then take that and turn that into something that's new, a new product, a new service, maybe something we hadn't thought of before, and that's innovation. And then again, creating an experience, making sure that we're creating a really uh, pleasant and useful and something that's not frustrating, the experience of engaging with the product, service, or brand. So for example, so this is a potato peeler. It's probably, you get it for like 99 cents uh, at the gas station convenience store or whatever. You can buy it anywhere. You know, it's, you know, it's guaranteed to rust in about a year. It's going to break on you. You probably chop your finger off with it. You know, it's, it's, it's designed from a business perspective. It is designed to meet a business need. You know, these materials are available. We have machines that can make this stuff. We can make, knock these things out you know, night and day, and, and we'll, we'll make money on it. It's no problem, you know. But it's, but it's really a one-sided kind of design. You know, if you think of what, you know, the folks at OXO did, this is sort of a classic, you know, uh, design case study. You know, they, they sort of took this very mundane thing, this potato peeler, and they built a whole suite of products around it, um, you know, by looking at, at it from a human perspective. They took the thing and thought about it, well, what do people really need? You know, they actually used universal design principles, which means that, you know, it can be used by someone who's eight or 80. Um, it fits in your hand well. It's comfortable. It looks good. It cleans easy. It's, you know, it's got all these sort of added benefits to it based on uh, sort of uh, user need and what people wanted and what, make, what would make the product uh, useful. I also think about, uh, you know, even in the entertainment area, my, I have a 12-year-old daughter, and she's a huge fan of Doctor Who. So everybody, everybody knew who Doctor Who is? Okay. Doctor Who is huge in our house. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, looking into it, you know, there's, there's fan fiction written by fans of the program using the characters, and, and, you know, people just write new stories based on these characters, and they share them with each other, and they... They publish them, and uh, you know there's like there's like 65,000 Doctor Who fan fiction stories out on the web, and it's again it's sort of you know the brand, the Doctor Who brand, has enabled folks to add value to it by taking the pro taking the thing, the the characters, the platform of Doctor Who, and and letting them define what's valuable for them, what's cool for Doctor Who to do, what's cool for the storyline to be. So it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And, you know, we've seen this before with, like, you know, car design or, or T-shirt design. So, uh, so it's, it, again, it's sort of this idea of value creation through design. Um, this is C.K. Pralahad. He uh, was the uh, uh, professor at uh, uh, University of Michigan uh, in the business school. And he wrote a lot about this. He wrote a lot about... He wrote a book called The Future of Competition uh, a few years back. And basically his premise is that the way that anybody's going to succeed in the economy nowadays is by value creation. And the only way you're going to get value creation is if you bring people into the process. Companies alone cannot create value. They don't have the capacity. They're too entrenched in their thinking. They don't, you know, they're not, they're not thinking out of the box. They're thinking about what makes sense for them as a company. And uh, he said, look, that doesn't work. You know, the companies that have really done well have designed products because they've invited people in, people that have used their products, and they've, they've allowed them to create value for them. What happens is 
when we have that dialogue with the people around us, the people who are using our using or engaging with the designs, whatever it is, whether it's a product or a print piece or a website, you know, they, they will tell us what they need and they will uh, help add value to it. And again, he sets out this very straightforward equation of, you know, co-creation will, will create value. Value equals innovation. If you can innovate, then you can have a competitive advantage. And this is sort of his, his premise. And this is what a lot of companies are doing now. It's not about, you know, they're, they're inviting people into the process as much as possible. And he, you know, he kind of lays it out fairly straightforward. It starts with a dialogue. You've got to invite them in and talk to them. And then it also has to be transparent. The process needs to be clear to everybody. There can't be any black box design. People have to be involved in every step of the way. Um, he also wrote another uh, really interesting book uh, called The, uh, it's called the uh, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. And, uh, and this, it's sort of poignant. It's, uh, you know, he's saying that you know, there are four billion people in poverty uh, uh, you know, around the world. And, and there's a way for organizations to, uh, you know, to create businesses to help these folks get out of poverty, to help raise the standard of living that they have. Uh, but the only way that that can happen is, again, his premise, you cannot, you cannot give a solution to them. She's like, Here, here's how you're going to get not be poor anymore. You've got to be, make them uh, involved in the process. They have to solve their own problem. The companies and organizations can provide resources and direction, but again, it's sort of that sense of respect and dignity that you give to people to help figure out how to get themselves to the next level, how to solve a problem. Um, just really quickly, uh, you know, uh, Mindstorm, the Lego Mindstorm is another good case example of, you know, we're a company who built this product, you know, it's this sort of a, Lego creation that you've got this little smart brick that they have that has a program, it's program, you know, and they put this out and this was doing fairly well for them and then some guy hacked into the uh, smart brick and he created a new uh, OS for it and he called it Lego OS and he put it out and people could download it and, you know, there were, you know, Lego could have done a lot of things. They could have put out a cease and desist. They could have sent out letters to the people that had these products and said, whatever you do, don't download this OS. You know, it'll validate your, or invalidate your, your warranty. But they didn't. They embraced the thing and they said, this is great. You know, hey, people are taking our stuff and they're modifying it and they're making it better and they're providing it to, you know, they're providing more value to uh, people that like our products. And other people have done it as well. So it's, it's sort of, you know, again, it's sort of embracing that idea of, of, uh, of bringing people into the equation. So really quickly, you know, why do we care about this? Because, you know, the world has become very small. Um, if you want something from across the world, you can get it in about two days. I ordered a pair of gloves from Italy, you know, and they came in about a week. You know, you can get whatever you want whenever you want it. So competition is global. It's no longer local. So you have to think, think more broadly about things. That means that more, there are more people involved. That means that, you know, more people want to be involved in the process. You think about how people have more access to in information now. Everybody's got, you know, what is it? There's like, a, there's 7.1 billion people in the world and there's 7.2 smartphones. There are more smartphones in the world right now than there are people. Uh, people are connected, they are, they're access to information, they can make decisions. If they're finding your product, service, brand, whatever, you know, they can find 10 other competitors in the, in the click. So again, it's, there's a lot of information out there, there's a lot of, uh, 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 you know, uh, the competition is steep, you know, and this sort of gets manifested in things like this where not only are they, you know, they're, they're connected, but they're, they're talking to each other as well. You know, it used to be, I used to work for General Electric a long time ago. We put out like annual reports, this is even before the web, right? You know, it's like, that was it, you know, it was like this one message sent out, you know, and that was it. And there was no dialogue. It wasn't like anybody could respond to the annual report, you know. It, just, it was, it just was what it was, you know. Now if we do that and we do that, it's, you know, that annual report is just a, like a mouse peep, you know, compared to, to the conversation that happens around it, outside of our control. And, and basically what you're looking at is that brands don't control the brand anymore. People control the brand because they are so connected, they are so networked, and again, people are going to want to be part of the process, they're going to want to be involved. And, Again, as design folks, as creative people, as people that are you know, uh, responsible for communications, the more that we bring those people into the conversation as, as opposed to holding them back, 
uh, the better off we'll be. Um, you know, another sort of benefit of bringing folks in is uh, it's just fun, essentially. Uh, if you're, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this when we uh, go to some of the exercises. Uh, just having people involved is actually makes, I think, the designer's job a lot more interesting, a lot more fun, um, and it's it's and it's it's almost a way of it is a way of doing research as well. So bringing people into the process is really key. Um, and again, it's sort of this first step in design thinking. So you know, empathize, understand con uh, context. You know, and I would say that through each of these stages, this is the uh, Stanford D School sort of. Uh, design thinking process, you know, in each one of these phases, there's a way to bring in audiences, clients, you know, stakeholders, whoever. So again, it's, it's, it's really critical that we do that. When I work with uh, design folks, it'll inevitably come up and they'll say, why do we have to do this research? I really don't want to do this. I'm a professional. I know what I'm doing. I went to school for this. I'm really talented, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, yeah, that's all very true. We are all professionals. We, are, we all know what we're doing. We, we are all skilled. And they always go, Steve Jobs didn't do research. And you know, what Steve Jobs actually said is that you know, they don't use focus groups and that you can't get people to tell you what they want without showing it to them. You need to show them things for them to uh, sort of see what the possibilities are. You know, Steve Jobs, yeah, yeah he, they listened to their customers they, very carefully. They did do a lot of research. They did get people involved in the design process. They didn't turn them into uh, art directors, though. And that's the thing. That's the difference. And that's what we're talking about. It's in no way should this be interpreted as, oh, we'll let the clients decide what they want, and, and that'll be great. Because, I mean, this is the nightmare, right? You know, they sort of boss you around and you know, they kind of yell at you, and they cross out all your good ideas, and then they show up with this. You know, this is like, so, you know, although he does look really happy in that car. Um, so again, it's not about turning people into art directors or, or having them make creative decisions for you. That's our job. That's, that's the designer's job. We, we, it's about getting their input so that we can make really educated creative decisions. Um, real quick, uh, I've, got, I've got about five exercises here that I'll show you at the end of this uh, uh, session just to sort of give you some practical stuff that we can work with. Uh, but just give you a quick little history lesson Apologize ahead of time. A lot of this sort of design thinking stuff happened in the uh, back at the Bauhaus. This is uh, Johannes Itten. He was uh, Walter Gropius' first choice for uh, instructor at the Bauhaus. Uh, he was uh, very much, uh, you know, an artist, a designer. Uh, came up with a, a theory, a Keller theory that we still use today. Very popular. Uh, his books are still in print. Uh, but he was kind of a kook too. He was a bit of a mystic. He had, you know, believed in. Uh, Mazadan religion, is into shaved heads, robes, vegetarianism, regular enemas, all sorts of stuff. And, and Gropius kind of after, you know, a year or so, he said, this isn't really what I want to do. I'm, I'm trying to build like this idea of, you know, integrating science and technology to build things that will help society and, and people. I don't, I don't need an artist. I need someone else. So he hired this guy uh, to take it in his place. And this is Laszlo uh, Maholi Naj. He's a Hungarian uh, engineer, photographer, designer, uh, you know, uh, just all around, uh, well-rounded <laughs> uh, uh, design uh, thinker. And uh, yeah, I mean, this guy is the guy, I think, that really kind of started this whole design thinking idea of integrating disciplines, not looking at design from just an artistic standpoint, but yeah, let's look at it from a technological standpoint. Let's look at it from a, you know, from a, from a social standpoint, and let's think about it in, in a lot of different ways. We don't want to just make beautiful stuff that we can replicate easily. We need to make beautiful stuff that works really well for people and serves, serves people. Um, one note, he's got the same glasses as Steve Jobs. Um, um, you know, this led to folks like Henry Dreyfus, who, again, integrating sort of scientific thinking and human factors and ergonomics into his designs. He, designed all sorts of, you know, the rotary phone and, you know, the Century 21 Limited, the Hoover Upright, the Polaroid Land Camera. But again, he was thinking about it not just from a design or he wasn't sort of layering on style. He was thinking about it from, 
from a, a people perspective, from how people use things, and again, integrating this. In fact, he put together, he wrote a book called, uh, I think it's called uh, The Measure of Man and Woman. And uh, he uses this uh, anthropometric kind of, he created this anthropometric scale for based on statistical human uh, measurements and things like that. And again, people are still using this today as a, as a tool for designing for people. So again, looking at design as not just an aesthetic function, but how do we serve people better? How do we make sure it's, it's, it's plugged into what their, uh, what their lives are really like? You know, folks like Charles Eames sort of jumped on this you know, thing. He, this is one of his first projects Eames did was this leg splint. He built this for the Navy. You know, it's cheap, it's stackable, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, easy to make, and, and it, it worked really well. It was much better than what the Navy originally had, and this was during the Second World War. And he made a pretty good amount of money off of this, and he was able to go and build his uh, design firm out of a lot of this work that he did here. So, uh, you know, this thinking of uh, sort of integrating people into the, into the equation, bringing them in, was not always around. Uh, there were always people that were sort of arguing against it. This is Anne Rand. She wrote a book uh, about, uh, called the, the Fountainhead. And it's a story of this young architect, Howard Rourke, who you know, works his way up from the bottom, finally gets this gig to, to build this, this beautiful building. He, he, he decides, he, he says, I'll do the building, but one stipulation, nobody can mess with my design because it's my design. All right, and they say, okay, great, go build your building. Okay, he builds the building, he comes back and he finds out somebody messed with his design and they changed something on it. So he's furious, he goes out and he blows up the building, right? So, so the ultimate, you know, sort of creative temper tantrum. Um, and, you know, but he makes this argument and sort of uh, the argument that, you know, man's ego is the fountainhead of invention. That he makes this argument and Anne Rand makes this argument, you know, that the individual is the thing, is the person that's going to make headway. He says, you know, like, whoever invented fire, you know, they probably killed him because they thought he was, you know, a witch or something like that, you know. So that was, that was a a lot of folks were sort of getting schooled in this idea in the late 60s, 70s, uh, and there are a lot of design folks that were out there that kind of had this thought in mind that it was about the design genius, the design hero. The designer would come in, walk into the room, tell me what the problem is, and I'll go solve it for you. And they would go into their little room, and they'd come back, and they'd be, you know. And it's, you know, it's sort of this very egotistical, you know, thing, and it, it just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, it made sense in like 1943 when the world was being, you know, trampled by nationalism and communism, but it doesn't make any sense now because we're so connected. It's just the world has changed so much, so it, it just doesn't fit in with where we are. So this has got to go away. The sort of idea of Howard Rourke has to die. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about some practical things that we can take away from this session. Um, there are really two types of collaborative design. There's participative design, and then there's user-centered design. We're pretty familiar with user-centered design. Uh, uh, this is actually a chart created by Liz Sanders. Uh, I think she's over at uh, Ohio State University. She's got a company called Make Tools as well. Uh, and she's a very big proponent, proponent on participative design, getting people involved in the design process. So, you know, if we think of what participative design is, it's kind of like that Seinfeld episode where, you know, Kramer wanted to start the pizza place so that people could come in and make their own pizzas, you know, they just, and then they'd put it in the oven. You know, so that's participative design, having the person actually create the thing. A more sort of, you know, reasonable example is this poster. This poster was created uh, uh, probably in early 2000, height of, you know, the AIDS epidemic in Kenya. Uh, Audrey Roberts, she's a professor, associate professor over at Rensselaer Polytech for graphic design went to Kenya and, you know, they, they, the posters that they were having to tell people not, you know, to, to, be, to be careful and were all generated by the government and they were just way off the mark. People weren't, they didn't acknowledge them, they didn't trust the government. She went there and she said, okay, well, let's get people, you know, village by village we'll go and we'll sit down and talk to these people and find out what makes sense to them. What, what, what are the words they would use? What are the images that they would use to create this poster? Because, yeah, this is a matter of life and death for a lot of folks. And we look at it and we go, eh, that's not very good. You know, I wouldn't put that up there. But it works, and that's the main thing. You know, it's not about the aesthetic. It's about does the thing do the job that we want it to do. And again, this is, I think this is, I, it's just a really powerful example of, you know, of, of how you can integrate folks into even something like a print piece and, and get a really good result. 
The other side of the coin is user-centered design. And that's, you know, Don Norman is a big proponent of this. He's sort of the, the guru of it. And it's, uh, you know, if you're doing any work on the web, you sort of know all the, all the strategies for, for uh, integrating people into sort of user testing for websites and things like that. And it's, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're tried and true methods. So there's a lot going on there. Both, and there's nothing wrong with either of these methods. They're both equally useful depending on what you're doing. Um, I would say with user-centered design, there are some drawbacks. Um, and it's just something we have to be conscious of. You know, it's, the, the joke is, if you ask a usability engineer to design a bar, they'll build this beautiful, clean, well-lit place, lots of tables to put your drinks on, good, lots of seating. It'd be nice, pleasant, well-lit, you know, laboratories and, and menus with 18-point type. But no one will be there because they're all getting drunk down the street, throwing beer on each other, you know, just because they want to have a good time. And again, it's sort of that idea of, you know, we can, we can have all the theories and all the great ideas and all the best practices, but in the end, we still need to know why are people going there and what do they want out of it. We can totally miss that. You know, another good example of that is sort of all the modernist architecture that was created, you know, in the, in the 40s and 50s. This is Pruitt-Igoe. This is a development that was in St. Louis, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of built in that Le Corbusier kind of vein of very clean, organized, you know, well-constructed buildings for folks, and you know, it's it's soulless. You know, it's just this terrible, soulless thing. And I think they eventually tore it down after maybe 10 or 15 years. It was just a complete disaster. But you know, I like this picture though because you kind of look at it. It's like, look at you know, around it is all this sort of, you know, there's some chaos going on there and things like that. But that's how people live. That's 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 the reality of their lives. We can't fight and make try to people fit into these very uh, uh, clean kind of models that we have. So that's why we need to bring them in. That's why we need to listen to them and, and talk through things with them. So again, uh, you know, uh, five easy activities to integrate this into your practice. So I'm assuming a lot of us are graphic designers, visual designers of some sort. So here are things that we can do for each step of the process. And again, just, you know, you don't have to be, uh, you know, have a master's in sociology to go out and, and do this kind of research. You don't have to be an MBA in marketing. You just need to have a Sharpie, a clean piece of paper, can't really see that, and uh, some cookies, and you'll be good um, <laughs> to get people on board. And so if we look at maybe a quick exercise that you could do from the, that initial sort of empathy stage of sort of understanding context, this is something very straightforward. It's, a, it's an empathy map, essentially. And what are the people experiencing? What are they seeing? What are they thinking? What are they hearing? What are their pains? What are their gains? That gives you a nice snapshot, and it's, it's a fun activity. And what you would do is, you know, you'd sit down with people, pr preferably users, and you would get them to write down things on, like, little sticky pads. You know, what are you seeing? And they would write a bunch, and you'd kind of stick them up here, and the same thing for thinking in all the other areas. And then you'd, you'd just sort of pull that together. And that's sort of a nice, quick way to get an understanding of what people are experiencing in their lives and, and in context to whatever it is that you're designing. Um, another step is uh, define, right? So trying to understand what the problem is. I'll give you an example of how we work through, uh, this is uh, for the School of uh, Information at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, new school, new dean, trying to rebrand itself, trying to figure out what they were about, you know, trying to rebrand information systems. Again, cookies, Sharpies, paper, people in a room, talking. We asked them, tell us the story, and then draw us a picture of what it is. And they came up with all these great illustrations you know, and, and, you know, this is fun. You know, I love sitting in a room and getting people to draw stuff out that don't know how to draw because it's, it's just kind of cool. You know, this is the monolith from 2001, you know, saying information systems are, like, echoing out this, you know, they're all-knowing, all-seeing. You know, this one was done by the dean, which is, I mean, visually, it's really interesting, too. I think that's really elegant, some of the stuff he wrote. And, you know, information is experienced. It's not, you know, data is stored. He's making a distinction about what it is that they do and how they do it. I think we're getting close on time, right? OK. Uh, a few more. You know, this talks about uh, you know, sort of the character of the school. And so we had people, you know, you could sit across the table with someone and ask them these questions, and they would tell you things. They tell you something different when they draw. And, and it's, I just think you get a lot more out of it. And you have something sort of physical that you can take back and start to work with uh, when, you, when you have them do these exercises. And again, it's, it's just. It, Draw what it looks like to you, and there's no right or wrong answer for it. You know, we eventually took some of this information and, and built 
some identity ideas off of it, and they, they selected a few, and then, you know, when it came to, they had a new building, so they started to put the, the uh, identity in the building. They actually had a, a marble floor that they put the, you know, the logo in, you know, that they had developed. And again, that's buy-in, that's, that's commitment. And the reason they were so committed was because they helped create the thing. They were part of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the creation of it and the experience of it. So uh, that's the other really important thing about bringing people in. It helps mitigate a lot of those political issues that you might have later on down the line. So the more you bring people in, the more supportive they will be of whatever direction you end up with. Um, if we talk about ideate, this is a real quick one. Brain sketching, super easy. You know, you go through a brainstorming session. You know, you're writing words down. You're throwing ideas around. And now you want to get something a little more visual. You can have people just sit down and, again, sort of either draw ideas or logos or whatever it is you're working on. And, and they each get a minute to write whatever they're doing. And then they pass the paper on to the person next to them and they get one from the other person on the other side when they continue the idea. And this is way it kind of keeps ideas fresh and they're constantly building on each other's ideas. So it's, again, it's a quick, easy way to kind of get a lot of ideas at one time and get people involved. Totemics is another uh, sort of, it's sort of a ideation prototyping exercise. And basically what this is, this is a metaphor sort of driven exercise that was deliver, or developed by Angela Dumas. I believe she's over at the London School of Business. Um, she wrote a paper a number of years ago about totemics. And totemics is interesting because it integrates words, photography, and drawing, and bringing that all together. It's sort of it's sort of like the one stop shop, you know, everything, kitchen sink kind of approach to getting ideas from people. And basically the premise is, have people f find, well, here, I'll walk you through it. Have people sort of define what the words are. What are the things that they're trying to achieve? You know, what are the words that they're using to describe if it's their brand, you know? Are these the words? They come up with, they come up with 10 words. You know, you've got people writing on a board. You know, you might get 50, 60 words that they come up with and then kind of whittle that down. Come up with 10 key words that they can use. You take that and then you sort of apply it to pre-designed things, so you'd say, Okay, well you had, you know, you had these 10 words. You know, what's quick, new, and fun? Show me some quick, new, and fun cars. Show me some quick, new, and fun chairs. Show me some quick, new, and fun animals. You know, finding things that sort of, uh, uh, you know, visually express those ideas. It's essentially you're creating a mood board at this point. And you kind of whittle those down into the key ideas and the ones that you think meet those words. And then you go and you, you know, talk through them, do mood boards with them, and, uh, uh, these are some of the ideas that we had, some, you know, architecture, animals, <coughs> chairs, things like that. Then you have them actually draw it at the end. You say, okay, you know, you pick this uh, dolphin, you know, why did you pick the dolphin? What would the dolphin look like if it was the brand? And what would the, you know, if it's a, if it's a product, what would the dolphin look like if it was the product, you know? And you start to gather some of that visual language or the thing that's already been designed and applying it to, uh, to the thing that you're working on. So it's a good metaphor uh, visualization technique. Let's see. Yeah, I'm just showing off the work there. More people showing off their work. People have a good time when we do this. So it's, again, it's sort of a fun way to bring people into the process. I'll show you one last idea. Um, testing ideas. Uh, there's an approach called the monadic approach. Um, we tend to do a really bad job of testing uh, our creative work. And there's there's some, some pretty good guidelines to work with uh, as far as getting sort of past subjectivity. One of the goals is to get past sort of the, uh, you know, the beauty contest. You know, if you come up to a client and you show them two designs side by side, they're going to look at it and they're going to go, I like that one because that one looks really good. They're not going to think about it in context to, say, the competition or, you know, what the, what the brand goal is. So this is a way to kind of get a little bit around that. And essentially, it's, it's really simple. You've got your two ideas. You show one idea to one group. You show the other idea to the other group. And you find out you know, through some, some crafted questions, you know, mainly about what does this mean to you kind of questions. You know, does it, and see which ones match up better to sort of the overall goal of the, of the brand. And that's a quick way to kind of find which way to go. And again, it's sort of one of the, one of the um, challenges is, is to get away from the beauty contest. Again, we, we there's a tendency to fixate on the thing that's the most aesthetically pleasing, 
as opposed to the thing that's most effective. So that's just something we need to think about. And I think, I think that's it, right? I was gonna say, leave you with this final note. The more that you bring people into the equation throughout the process, the easier it will be for you to design from a creative standpoint, you'll have a lot of data to work with, a lot of uh, input to work with. You'll be working toward a goal to support somebody, to help somebody achieve something. And in the end, you know, you'll get buy-in. You'll get people will support your idea uh, because people support what they help create. And then this is a piece of shameless self-promotion. If you'd like to read more, <laughs> you can purchase my book online. Um, but yeah, if you uh, have any questions, feel free to email me. And uh, thank you. I appreciate your time.